So last time I asked people what kind of video they wanted to see and there was an overwhelming majority for a video that was related to the playlist downstream processing for the pharmaceutical industry. So that's why this video where I will discuss the downstream processing of microprotein, which you might commonly know more as that it's used in corn. So it's used as a meat substitute. So I'm Marluce Peters and my expertise is in bioreactor engineering. And I have a lot of playlists that kind of touch on, the, on this topic. And particularly today, I will show how we can use this and actually why the downstream processing in this case is actually rather simple. So that made people actually choose this particular uh, production mass. Now, in, in the first image, you can also see like what under the microscope, what this uh, structure of a uh, microprotein, which actually is a protein which is produced by a fungus. So what it looks like. So you can see, you can see these like fibers and these networks. And that's why this particular uh, protein very much has a similar texture to meat. And that's why that's so important. But let's discuss, first of all, the production a bit. If you want to know more about that, I do have a video that really details a specific uh, production using an airlift reactor. But in this video, we'll talk more about the challenges and what happens actually after you produce it. So let's have a look. First of all, like as I said, uh, microprotein, so this is foodstuff, which is produced by a fungus, Fusarium vinonatum. So people have been eating fungi for ages. So think of your mushrooms. So that's why fungi are a really popular choice as like a food substitute, because it's known to be relatively safe. And what actually happened is usually people go looking around for like uh, something with the desired properties. And in this case, it was very important to have a very high protein content because it needs to be an alternative source um, to actually meat uh, or animal protein. And what they found in this particular case, it didn't have to look very far, even though they looked at lots of different uh, fungi that were isolated. But in Marlow Bottom, which is a compost uh, um, not far away from actually where the site is, they found a fungus which was very safe to eat and with the desired protein content. Uh, the fermenters that were used for making this microprotein in Billingham were the largest continuous flow culture systems. So you can see they are really, really big. Uh, and this continuous was then still, at the moment we've seen when I talk about bioreactors, you see like a drive towards continuous systems, but it was very unlikely to have continuous systems in place for something like this production of this fungi. But like you can see using continuous production that you really reduce the cost. And that's why this is so important. And a particular technology they used in this case uh, was an airlift reactor, which typically tends to be really tall, but it's very easy to scale up and actually the, it has quite a high efficacy. So that's why it's very suitable for very large production. However, there are a couple of challenges within the biotechnology uh, that we need to discuss. And that's what I'll do in this video. First of all, if when it comes to cost, because the key, uh, even though when you have like these meat substitutes, first of all, you need to be able to compete in price and probably actually have a lower price compared to meat in order to have something that's competitive. And in this case, the fungi, they feed on a particular carbon source, in this case, a, a glucose syrup for the original corn production process. There are some alternatives towards that. Uh, but that actually is quite high in cost. So that's one of the things where people are looking at actively su substituting this. There are, obviously, this is food stuff. So you need to imagine that there are some concerns. So the concerns relate to uh, formation of microtoxins, which is something which is regularly checked. Uh, but there's also something we'll come back to later, the nucleic acid levels. So when you consume this, this might lead to a problem related to safety as well. So that's definitely something that uh, in the downstream processing that needs to be tackled. And another thing to, to think about is, uh, because this is a continuous culture, so this can go on for quite a while. Um, but unfortunately, it can't go beyond six weeks, and that's the bottleneck because people see that after around a thousand hours, whether they use an airlift reactor or whether they use a simpler stirred uh, tank reactor, mutations start to occur. And then actually the problems with these mutations, and I have like a, a picture of that later, is that they have a different shape. So they no longer kind of resemble that particular uh, structure that we actually want in order to have like something which resembles a meat substitute. So that's a big problem. Now, looking at the general process, in order to understand the downstream processing, we need to know a little bit about what happens before and afterwards as well. So I mentioned that we have a carbon source. Uh, so in this case, you can see this is glucose syrup. We obviously have water in the bioreactor. 
uh, and then we need uh, a media and we feed also in air and oxygen because uh, it is an aerobic process so you need to have oxygen in there and you also need a nitrogen source and in this case this is done by supplying ammonia. Now once we have all of that mixed together you will need to make sure that the reactor is placed in and that it's sterilized and if we want to uh, continuously operate it what we will need to do is continuously supply glucose. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of how you can operate these reactors. So I think I talked about the chemostats, uh, turbido stats, and retention stats in another lecture. But this particular one is operated as we call as a glucostat. So it means that you continuously have an access of glucose in there, so you continuously have enough for the fungi uh, to feed on. Now, if you compare this to other videos, this is where it becomes interesting, because the downstream processing really seems quite simple here. And one of the things which you don't see here, which you do see when I looked at, for instance, recombinant protein production or enzymes, is no chromatography steps. So this means whereas the downstream processing can make up as much as 50% of your cost, if not more, this is not necessarily the case. Here the, the cost for the carbon source and whatever you feed uh, to the material is actually much higher. But what are the steps that you actually need uh, within the downstream processing? Now, after we finish the fermentation, and it takes a couple of days to start this and then you can continuously operate it once it, it, it's actually in steady state, we will need to reduce the RNA content. And the problem with that, I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. And then it becomes simpler because all you need to do is you need to centrifuge it. And um, so you will get, uh, uh, the, you can harvest the fungal biomass, like say up to 30% weight percent of solid content. And then it gives you the mycoprotein. However, you can imagine that's not necessarily directly corn straight away. So in this lecture, we'll focus more on what happens to the mycoprotein. But I will touch on the things that are important in order to give it that very specific structure uh, that you need for it to order to kind of resemble more what meat is. Now, having looked at this process, this is where this RNA content is important. So the purine, which is a nucleacid, uh, unfortunately in humans, not actually in bacteria or other things, this is a metabolized uric acid. And uric acid is an, uh, a very well-known problem because this can crystallize. So if you know someone with gout, you can get these crystals that are associated uh, with this. So that's why if you look at the WHO requirements, you're only allowed to have an RNA content of about 2%. So what they do in this particular uh, reactor, which also makes the downstream processing easier, is we can heat it to 68 degrees for tw about 20 to 30 minutes, um, and actually you get then to an RNA content of only 1%. So they are well below what they would recommend with the WHO. Now, another big advantage is that this works in the same medium. Um, so the advantage is you don't need to change the pH, you don't need to change anything in the medium. Uh, it's a very simple step in that regard. Now, and then finally, then you have a suspension and you need to recover your material and you need to increase the solid uh, content via centrifugation, as I mentioned. We check it for mycoproteins every 24 hours because these are the things uh, that need to pass in terms of quality control. Uh, so you can't just leave it until the end, you really need to do this throughout the process. And one of the biggest challenges if you use like an air reactor or something else is that you very well need to control the parameters in terms of pH and temperature. And the reason for doing that is here you can actually see what starts to happen uh, with these mutations, which naturally occur over time. Uh, and there are ways of doing this, but the problem with how you can combat this, for instance, uh, by diluting it or by changing the conditions, is that actually, you know, it also reduces your yield. So the problem is you want to have a way where you don't actually reduce the yield, but you still get less of these mutations. So what researchers are working hard on is looking at ways of, for instance, if you can knock down specific genes that cause these mutations, because you can see if we go to the wild tap strain, you see the other ones are far more branched. And that's what you really want to avoid. And so normally we look at, for instance, microorganisms that produce something. So here you're actually interested in the fungal biomass itself. Uh, but it needs to be within a specific network structure in order for it to be applicable and to be used in foodstuff. So you can imagine we harvest the fungal biomass, but that's not necessarily directly what corn is. So there are a lot of different steps after that. Uh, and what is really important here, and this is, I guess, the last bit where I'll stop. We can also talk about packaging. 
Uh, but here we'll talk about the texture that you want to get out of the microproteins. So when it's related to food, you need to give it a specific consistency. And uh, so there will be an influence of compounds that can gel it and that can firm it up. And so before, like uh, it's not so often used uh, so much anymore, but like you used to have eggs, for instance. So there are specific proteins that you can add to it that gel up the structure. Uh, but what seems to be really important for corn is that it actually is frozen for a while uh, and actually up to weeks. And you can form these ice crystals and that's what really helps to kind of firm up the structure in order to get it even more to what meat is like. An advantage is what you can imagine if you put like some meat in a pan, you can literally see it shriveling up. And obviously that doesn't happen with microprotein. So for instance, there are like some advantages as well to consider when it comes to using that compound. Besides uh, looking at it from environmental implications, uh, because obviously it uses a lot um, less carbon dioxide involved in the process to make the mi microprotein compared uh, to, for instance, if you would get this from animals. Now the question is, you've seen now how simple this downstream processing is. So why are there not more out there? And particularly uh, f bearing in mind that the patents of corn expired in 2010. So there are a lot of new players on the market and a lot of uh, startups that are looking at producing microprotein. Now you can imagine that this is technology that has been developed for decades by corn. So particularly the control in the reactions is quite complicated. So it, it is very hard to compete with people that have really optimized the technology down to a T. But what they are a couple of, and a couple of startups are indicated here on this map, which are all across the globe. And another interesting one in the UK, and they make uh, Abunda. And this is rather than using this glucose syrup, they use an alternative carbon source. So they make it from natural sugars. Uh, so it is really interesting to look at producing this from, for instance, waste material, if you really want to go look at the full circular economy and see how we can still incorporate this uh, as a new material as food. A lot of research has been going on uh, to look at the causes for the formation uh, of these mutants, uh, such as knocking down certain gene genes, because you are limited to this kind of six weeks protocol at the moment. And actually this applies to both an airlift reactor and a stirred tank. So there are a couple of different ways of how to produce this. An airlift reactor involves a lot of bespoke technology, and so which is very hard to control, but the advantages are that it's very easy to scale up and it has a very high efficacy. So also the shear levels are much lower. So the question is, if you have like a stirred tank, you have much higher shear levels. And obviously, as we know that uh, plant cells, such as like these fungi, they don't particularly like it. So there is a bit of trade-off to consider. Uh, but a stir tank is much more like we know a lot more about the technology. It's much easier to implement uh, rather than having to invest a lot in setting up new airlift reactors. So a move towards a stir tank reactors might be very beneficial in terms of less costs uh, and for new players to enter this market as well. But hopefully you've seen here that downstream processing doesn't necessarily always need to be complicated. It can also be very practical. Uh, but you do need to, like if you're working with recombinant proteins, consider a lot more steps. And, and bearing in mind, like I made this look really simple, but actually there were decades of research that were, went into making sure that corn was actually safe to eat. So you can imagine that everything needs to be very thoroughly controlled. And that's the control that we don't necessarily, and some of the things we don't understand of the reaction so much yet, that's what's holding uh, it back in terms of being implemented in a big scale. We have plenty of more videos uh, on the pharmaceutical industry, so if you want to learn more about particular topics, then either have a look at our playlists, which are listed as different courses, or do leave in the comments on what topics you're interested in hearing more about. Thanks for watching.